So Clear Vision Wednesday, super excited to be here. I'm Claudia Mühlenweg. I am the um, founder of Holistic Vision and the creator of the Natural Clear Vision Method. And today we have a super interesting topic. At least I think it's interesting. It's about visual illusions and how we can use visual illusions to improve our eyesight. And I have prepared a little slideshow. And then after that, we have a little surprise guest, which I'm also excited about. So without further ado, let me open the slideshow because I felt with visual illusions, it would probably be a good idea to have some, some visual cues here. So hopefully you can see my slides. And if not, then Trisha can unmute yourself and say something, but I'm assuming you can. So you probably all, like we're gonna come back to this particular image, but you've probably all seen these kind of things where what is darker, which gray is darker A or B. And you know, you probably know the, the right answer, but right A looks a lot darker than B. But again, we're gonna come back to that. So let me move forward. Again, medical disclaimer, whatever I'm doing here every Wednesday is not medical advice. It's not intended to replace traditional vision care or regular checkups. So you can read all this, but basically I'm a vision coach, I'm a vision teacher, and I'm educating you based on my research and my experience and that of my contributors. So I thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about what's the difference because hallucinations is you know often thrown in together with illusions. And a hallucination is basically, this is from the dictionary, it's a false sensory perception that has a compelling sense of reality despite the absence of an external stimulus. It may affect any of the senses, but auditory and visual hallucinations are most common. Hallucinations are typically a symptom of a psych psychotic disorder, but may also result from substance abuse, neurological abnorm uh, abnormalities, and other conditions. It is important to distinguish hallucinations from illusions, which are misinterpretations of real sensory stimuli. And that's really the big difference, right? The false hallucination is a false sensory perception versus illusions are real sensory stimuli. And this is actually not from the dictionary. This is from a website from psychology. I forgot to quote the actual, or list the, the actual person who wrote this. And an illusion, an instance of a wrong or misinterpreted perception of a sensory experience. Now, visual illusion is a misperception of external visuali, visual stimuli that occurs as a result of a misinterpretation of the stimuli, such as a geometric illusion. Visual illusions are among the most common type of illusion. Now, um, you probably heard of Dr. William Bates. He's the creator. He's really the creator of the Bates method. He was the ophthalmologist that over 100 years ago did this groundbreaking research and really was the father of vision improvement as we know it. So he says, illusions of perfect, you know, this is the language from the 20s. This is from 1924. Illusions of perfect sight. Illusions are not seen. They are imagined. One cannot have perfect sight without illusions. When I read that, I was like, wait, so let me, and I want you to kind of pause for a second. And I, let me go back to this. Illusions are not seen, they're imagined. One cannot have perfect sight without illusions. When I read that, I was like, what? So what do you think about that? And you can maybe type in the chat. And if you're on YouTube, you can also type in the chat. Can we not have perfect vision without illusions? And if so, why? This is just like an open-ended question. You can continue to think about that. And then imperfect sight. Do you think imperfect sight, you know, basically anybody has a blur, refractive error, any of those things also has illusions. And are they different from those with perfect sight? So I think that was an interesting thing to ponder. And, but I'd be moving forward. So Dr. Bates, and this is from the Better Eyesight Magazine from 1924. Um, and this is really the, the core of the Bates method is, first of all, the Bates method is 90% of what we call imagination or brain or mind. It's not really about eye exercises. This is really important to understand. But these are the four things that he calls out in this article, central fixation. And if you've worked with Bates or the Bates method, you know what that means, but we will also go and a little bit uh, um, look at these different factors, what that means. The second is swing. The third is halos. And the fourth is blinking. And blinking even can kind of like, oh, it's like blinking is an visual illusion. <laughs> but 
no worries, we will we will dive into that. So central fixation, and I did a whole Clear Vision Wednesday just on central fixation. You can also get go back to that. Central fixation basically means seeing best where you are looking. And the eye with normal vision sees one part of what it looks at best and everything else worse in proportion as we move away from the point of maximum vision. And just a little bit of anatomy here really quickly. So the fovea is that little indentation in the back of your eye. That's where you have the sharpest, most accurate, and also the most color, like all the cone cells. This is where you have your best vision. And you've all seen these diagrams, right? Where the, the light rays are bundled by the lens and then they fall onto the fovea in the back of your eye. So this is an actual anatomy fact that our retinas are not like film and an old school camera. They're not sensitive in the same, you know, like a film, right? The film is sensitive, don't matter if you're in the corner or in the center of the film in an old school camera, but the retina is different. So that we do have the phobia with the most high resolution perception, so to speak. And then the further out you go to the periphery, the less resolution we have. So what that means is, and again, this is just a demonstration. This is not perfect by any means, but it means if you were to regard the C in central fixation, that C would look blacker or sharper or clearer, especially blacker than the end, let's say in fixation, the end at the end. So if we zoom in a little bit, you know, if you look at that little serif on the C, you would see that sharper or better. And of course, that is a visual illusion because the whole world, everything printed is black, right? It's not like the printer ran out of ink, or maybe he did in, <laughs> in some examples, but usually the printer didn't run out of ink. It's all equally black. But we see that area that we look at, if you have perfect sight, we see that area best. And in case of letters, black letters, it means it looks blacker, right? If it's obviously different, if you look at a flower, a flower wouldn't look black. But if you look at letters, it looks like that. And so here's an example. Like if you look at one of these dots, notice how the dot that you're looking at looks better. It looks sharper, it looks blacker. And if it doesn't, you might be using imperfect vision. You might be trying to strain or stare or try to see all the dots equally clear, which we cannot do anatomically speaking. So this is a great way I like to, to share with my, especially with your, if somebody is farsighted or press myopic, connect the dots is a really fun thing I love to do as a kid. And it really practices the shifting, the peripheral vision, the moving your attention from spot to spot. So that's and you in noticing wherever you look that you see things best. Now, I'm going over this a little quickly because again, we already had a whole deep dive into central fixation that you can watch if you like to know more about that. And then swing. So swing is, um, you know, you might think of swing dancing. <laughs> this is a, a terminology in the vision improvement world. And I will ex ex explain that again also a little bit. So basically swing means that there's an apparent movement of stationary objects caused by our head and eye movements, obviously also our body movements. And uh, I'm in Germany right now and I was in the forest the other day. So I, I just recorded this little video as I was walking through the forest. And so this is the, the effect that it seems that the trees, right? They're obviously not moving. <laughs> they're very static, but they appear to be moving. So as you're walking, this is probably an example where it's easy to see. It seems like, right, these trees are moving backwards as, as if I would be standing still and the trees are being pulled by some kind of dolly in a Hollywood film. So that's that idea that you see, and obviously I'm making big steps and I'm moving a lot. However, the more you move, obviously, the more movement you would see that apparent oppositional movement of your world. And here's another one. As I was walking up in the metro station, I was walking up the stairs, the same vertical now, but that, that feeling that the stairs actually, as if it's like an escalator and the stairs are moving away under me as, you know, as if they were moving. Of course, this is an illusion because the stairs are not moving. I'm the one walking up the stairs, but I hope you get my point. It's that idea that the better your vision, the more movement you will see at all times. And in the Bates method, we practice something called the long swing. We don't, again, I did a whole Chia Vision Wednesday just on the long swing, but this is basically a movement that you do in a 180 degree circle. Well, so you're getting, you're moving in a, in a circle, but the idea is that you are 
noticing the whole world spinning around you and your eyes making these tiny, tiny, tiny jumps called saccadic eye movements. Um, I'm not going to play that whole thing, but you basically, as you are doing this, you see the eyes are making these little jumps and a healthy eye makes a lot of these little jumps, really fine little movements. And the worst, if your vision is really um, not good, how else do I say this? You might be, your eyes might be more like ping pong balls. They might make like two or three jumps in a 180 degree circle. So that's a practice that we do and particularly to help improve these eye movements and to be aware of that um, visual illusion of apparent um, oppositional movement. So when we go into finer vision and when we go into the improvement a little more, what we call an ocular swing. So ocular swing, <clears throat> Your body isn't moving, your head isn't moving, it's literally just your eyes moving. And um, again, this is a little slide I showed before in another Clear Vision Wednesday. So the saccadic eye movements are these little rapid jumps and the more, the better. And let's talk about ocular swing right now. So this is, depending on your screen that you're looking at this, um, this might be way on my second monitor, it's pretty big, the jump, so you might, you know, might want to move your head. If you look from the little left dot to the right dot, if you're like on an iPhone right now or on a phone, you would probably use an ocular swing because it's a pretty small gap and you would just move your eyes left and right. So um, either way, you can practice both ways. But now imagine you're looking on the left little dot. So the big black dot is to the right of you. Now you're moving your attention to the right little dot and now the big black dot is on the left. So it moved, right? And when I first began my vision improvement journey, I did not see anything moving. Nothing was moving. But the more you relax and the more you practice, now I cannot not see it moving. And again, of course, it's a visual illusion. But the more you see this movement, even if you just move your eyes one like nano millimeter, you would see a little bit of an oppositional movement. And of course, that depends on how much your eyes are moving, right? If your eyes are making bigger jumps, you, like me walking through the forest, you see a lot more movement than if you just move your eyes like a quarter of a millimeter. Um, so, and this is part of the practice here. Imagine that little eye on the swing that you want to start with bigger movements and, you know, practice. You want to see that movement of the center of that, if that's a dot or a line, whatever it is. But your object that you're moving your eyes left and right to right, left and right, left and right. So when you see it with bigger movements, and maybe initially you move your head along, and then slowly, slowly you move your head less and less. And then at some point, you just look left and right of that dot, as in this example, and you will still see a little vibration, is still a little bit of a movement of that dot in the opposite direction. So this didn't happen for me overnight. This took me quite a long time to achieve. And it can be frustrating. And the more you try or you force yourself, the less you will see this. So it's all about relaxation and like being aware of the concept. And then out of a sudden, you will probably see it in the world when you least expect it. Um, so getting into number three, the halos. And this is basically that the white, and I'm talking about an eye chart here, that the white appears to be whiter when it's next to a black object like a letter, creating a kind of a halo effect inside and around the letter. So we're coming back to this, this thing, right? Which gray is darker? And my example might not be as dramatic as the one on the title slide, but probably everyone would say, well, the, the one with B looks looks darker, right? The one on the on A looks, looks a little lighter. However, you probably know the answer. They're the same exact gray because our brain compares contrast. Our brain looks at the gray on the white and be like, okay, that's darker than white. So it looks pretty dark, but compared to black, it looks light. So it's all about comparing contrasts. And now this is the solution here of that graphic on the title. You see that A and B are indeed the same gray, which looks is pretty mind blowing, right? So our brain is really easily tricked by these visual illusions. But here's the thing about the halos. If the white looks a little wider, and here's a row, row of O's, unfortunately, they're a little blurry, so I apologize. That's not your vision, that's actually my slide. <laughs> it's too blown up, that image, but it's so it's actually a little blurry. But if you, um, maybe you look inside the big O and you'd start noticing as you are relaxing and looking at the big O in the center, that it looks like it's a little bit more gray and there's almost a little thin ring of white 
And I'm going to show it here again. This is on a gray background now, but maybe you, you notice as if the O has a lamp behind it, like a little ring light, and it's there's a little bit of a white halo on the inside and the outside. So what I'm trying to say is it looks like it looks like this, um, that visual illusion if you see it. And again, I didn't see that initially. O's work really well. I find O's fi are really helpful to start seeing that. And even if you're in the blur zone or it's slightly blurry, it will help you. And the whiter the white, the blacker the black will look. And it really will help clear up images, especially if you're just on that kind of, you know, edge of blur when you're like a little bit in the blur and you're not like, it's not super blurry, but you're at that kind of right at that sweet spot, maybe a few centimeters or inches out of your blur, uh, out of your clarity zone, it can really, really help um, seeing these halos, imagining these halos as Bates would say. Um, and if you look at small prints, all the halos basically together create this kind of what we call a thin white line. It's almost like a little shelf that the letters are sitting on. And once you, again, my background is gray because otherwise you wouldn't see that <laughs> because it is a visual illusion um, that here I'm actually made, not an illusion, but an actual image, but that's what it's supposed to look like. And when you see that, it almost looks like the letters are 3D or they're very black. They're almost like, jumping out of the page versus when your vision is blurry, they look kind of gray and fuzzy and maybe doubled or tripled. So this thin white line is a really powerful way to read where you're looking, where you're looking or moving your attention along the thin white line at the bottom of the letters. And that took me also a long time to practice. So don't get too stressed out about this, but just know these concepts because when you have perfect vision, you will automatically see these things. And again, it might not happen overnight, so the last one, this was the one in this article, was like blinking? Why is blinking a visual illusion? So um, I'm going to quote Dr. Bates because he can say it best. But he said, many persons with normal sight have the illusion that they do not blink. They believe the eyes are always at rest and that the eyes are continually open all the time. In all cases where the sight was normal, blinking occurred almost every second. And continuing this, blinking occurs more frequently with a normal eye when the light is imperfect or when the conditions are unfavorable for perfect sight. When the light is good or the conditions are most favorable for good sight, blinking occurs at less frequent intervals. And then lastly, coming back to the imperfect sight, persons with imperfect sight do not rest their eyes as often as those with normal vision. When they are encouraged to blink more, Frequently, their sight usually improves. And here at the end, I literally grabbed my last video I did for Instagram. So this is not, <laughs> there's no filter, there's no retouching. This is me and all my wrinkly. <laughs> but basically, this is a video. I did a Instagram reel and I just wanted to play this because I wasn't, this wasn't the video where I'm like, I'm demonstrating blinking. I was literally a video I just shot um, and um, I wanted to show you, I just, I just blink. Like, I don't think about blinking. I just, it's something that I do automatically, like Bates talked about. But when I first started with my vision improvement journey, I did not blink. I did not blink. I could not blink for over a minute. So that's basically the, um, the end of my presentation. So let me stop my screen share. And um, I, I hope this was helpful and interesting and we can kind of have a discussion now. But before we do that, I want to bring on my special guest. Let me see where I can find him. Let's see, where did he go? If you turn your video on, um, right now I don't see him. Let's see, did he drop off? Let me see. I'm here. Ah, you are, now I find you. Okay, let me bring you on. There you are. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> hey there, hey there. So this is Love Kevin it. Wooding. He is a fantastic vision teacher in London. Right? I think you live in London, right? Yeah, yeah. I do. Okay. And uh, you've been doing this for a long, 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 long time, uh, way before I, I, well, I did work on my own vision, but I wasn't anywhere close to teaching this. So yes. share a little bit with us. You said you had a really, we, we were WhatsApping the other day, actually, I think yesterday. And you said you had a really cool anecdote about visual illusions that I thought would be interesting for everybody to hear. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I was just looking up, there was a quote of Bates in his original um, Perfect Sight book where he talks about visual illusions. He talks about illusions of imperfect vision and illusions of normal vision, just as you have been. And there's one he mentioned here, which was quite 
kind of interesting. He says, the last is the most curious illusion of all. And he says, no matter what the position of the head, and regardless of the fact that the image on the retina is inverted, we always see things right side up. And there's a story about this, which is secondhand. It comes from my teacher, my trainer. And he would sometimes in the lessons when I was going to him, uh, he, would, he would tell me little stories about clients and things that people were experiencing. And uh, he had this fellow come to him who was, I would say, of a very skeptical nature. And uh, he felt that, um, that any kind of uh, improvement, you know, was, uh, he was, I think, basically there to convince himself that vision could not be improved. And he said to my teacher, he said to Peter, but surely any improvement that you see is impossible because it's, you know, it's genetic or it's hereditary and, and, you know, vision doesn't improve. Of course it doesn't, otherwise everyone would be doing it. And uh, so any improvement that you see must be an illusion. And Peter said to him, well, actually, all vision is an illusion because what you see out there, you know, in the big world is actually the size of a postage stamp on the back of your retina, on the back, in the back of your eye, and it's upside down. <laughs> now, for whatever reason, this fellow, it, it this literally blew his mind because suddenly he realized how much of vision is mental, that it had to be a mental process. And instantaneously his vision completely cleared he, he could see perfectly it was so disturbing to him because it was literally under what's the word pulling the rug out from under his feet at the same time because everything he thought he knew about vision was wrong and what else could be wrong in his life i mean it was just completely mind-blowing and he fought very hard to shut the vision down again. And he succeeded in about 15 minutes. So we might think that everyone wants to see. Some people don't want to see, even though they think they might. So it's a very, very curious little anecdote about visual illusions. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing that story. And Peter Mansfield, I put in the chat, was your teacher. He wrote a fantastic book. I don't have that handy right now, but um, thank you for sharing that. I'm just curious if anybody has questions on YouTube or here on Zoom with us in the Clear Vision Club, because to me, this is such a fascinating topic, um, the visual illusions, that idea that, you know, I love that story also, like everything is the size of a little tiny, you know, one inch eyeball on the back of your eye, when in reality. Yeah. Um, so, wow, yeah. We should all be so lucky, says Tracy. Well, that guy made his vision worse again because he didn't, right? He didn't want to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Super interesting. So I don't know. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, what do you think are the um, illusions of imperfect sight? To me, to me, it was so interesting because I knew these concepts, yet I wouldn't see them. And I was making all this effort in order to see them. And of course, that doesn't result in anything that makes it worse. So does anybody else have that experience that, um, for instance, the halos, um, that was a big one for me to see the halos because it actually helped clear up the text and obviously central fixation. Uh, Delia is saying, I did not really understand the idea of reading with the white line. So you basically, um, the thin white line that, uh, let me see, where can you look that up? Um, it's in my courses. I don't think I did a lesson on that uh, on YouTube on the thin white line, but basically, Start with seeing the halos. Start with seeing the halos on the bigger blacker letters on the eye chart. That are the O's particularly. That's usually the easiest one. And when you see that, when you look at or even whole text, like maybe Kevin, you have another idea, but when you hold text and maybe you even like look softly, you see that it looks wider right between the lines of text than on the edges. Or look at the margin of the, the page and then look in the center. And it, you know. Yeah, I, I like if, if you have that critical mind, well, it's the same white. It is the same white. It just appears to look wider. I hope that makes sense. So there's a question, maybe Kevin, now since you, I have you on here, how to read um, not to make your eyes tired? <laughs> rest, rest them frequently. Blinking. <laughs> yeah, blinking, closing them for a period of time, looking away. 
Yeah. And uh, I mean, go ahead. I was going to say off, often the thing with reading, it's, it's, uh, it can be so fascinating what you're reading and you think you want to know what well, and need to know what's next. And so you keep pushing the eyes harder and harder and you just, uh, well, just think about how they're going to feel at the end of it all. Yeah. I, what I did, I put a, a bookmark on the next page. And so that an actual physical book, which is like, we can't really do that with the e-readers, but, and then when I reached that page, I would always look up and look in the room and, uh, because I was farsighted. So for me, the near vision was always my most challenging piece. Like the very distance vision was not that hard. My, I didn't, I didn't, I did all this before I ended up progressives or bifocals. So my distance vision was still good, but anything in the middle, on, especially close up was like really my most challenging distance. Mm -hmm. So reading became definitely a challenge for me for, for a while because like the eyes were straining and then you don't realize that you're straining because it looks clear. And like you said, you probably don't, I didn't blink. I was staring. And so I always used the poster on the wall um, that had black lines on it. And I would always like would start and the lines were single. And then I would read and I would have a single and I would read and I was single. And then I was, I got carried away. The book was so good. I was like reading, reading, reading. I'm like, oh, and then I looked up and everything was doubled. And I was like, oh, I've been straining. So yeah, it, it takes it takes awareness and practice in my opinion. It takes like just a lot of awareness about your habits. Yeah. Let's see if we have other questions. Question, do visuals, visual, illusion, visual illusions work different for a nearsighted person than for a farsighted person? Hmm. What are your thoughts, Kevin? Well, I mean, yes, I mean, there, there are some visual illusions that feel more comfortable for some people, like, um, you know, you have those those 3D visual visual kind of games that people play, and sometimes people are really good at those, and others have a lot of trouble with them. Uh, but you can learn something from things you find difficult as well. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the main things about visual illusions is that if you can be playful with what's happening, don't, you know, struggle too much if you're kind of puzzled about what's going on or, or anything like that, but more playful and interested because then you're engaging and you're using your eyes in a you know positive kind of environment um, i love that and i also think it's about i always i said shared that story so many times i don't have that little tray here but i did the teacher training as you know in london with margaret and Eileen. you know margaret was also your teacher right margaret and peter yeah yeah. And um, I remember, and I did not see any, I moved my, I did not see any oppositional movement. Yes, in the long swing, but not when it came to the ocular swing, there was nothing was moving. And I remember we did a week and I had an X-ray in London and I was one of those home decor stores and there was a tray and it had like, like gray lines with little graphics. And I didn't even like the design. I was looking at the tray. I was just like, like, what is the price? I was looking at it. And suddenly the lines were moving and I wasn't really moving my head. I was like, oh my God, the lines are moving. And everybody thought I was completely nuts, you know, in that store. I was so excited because I had never seen them move. However, I had the concept in my head and I was, you know, I, I wasn't practicing. I wasn't trying. I was just like, it suddenly appeared because I was relaxed. And so I think a lot of times, I don't know about you, but sometimes I have clients and they're like obsessively practicing and practicing and practicing. And it's like, you have to let go also at a certain amount. Like you have to let go, let it sink in, understand the concept, and then maybe with an out attachment, do that again. But use your daily life, use your whole world to, to practice these things and not just be like, I need to use, you know, the shifter. That's the only time I can practice shifting. No, go in the forest, go up the stairs, notice oppositional movement. You know, that's 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 my piece of advice here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cool. Let me see if there's any other questions. When you say vision is mainly mental, why is that vision during night is so much harder or worse? Okay, why is that vision during night? Oh, you mean night vision, at, you know, not at sleep, but actually at night. Um, well, I can, I mean, we have different cells that work at night. It's the raw cells and the raw cells are the cells that don't have color vision and they're not very, they're very, they're very light sensitive. They're about hundred thousand times more light sensitive, but they don't have that sh same sharpness or crispness. So unless there is artificial light, like I have lamps here because it's already dark, 
Um, but unless you have those uh, artificial light from the moon or street lights or car lights, you know, that is our night vision is just not as great, period. I mean, anything else you want to add to that, Kevin? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, one of the things about the you know, modern world that we, you know, live in, there is a lot of light around all the time, you know, street lights, car lights and that sort of thing, especially if you live in an urban sort of location that generally the eyes are not getting as much darkness as they would have been used to in a previous, you know, 100, 200 years ago, or, you know, living in a very, um, you know, country, country location rather than in a city. Uh, this is, this has a, an effect on how your night vision works. And you can actually work on it. You can actually sort of decide, I'm going to go out, drive out into the countryside and walk along a, a road, you know, obviously yeah. do it somewhere safe, not where there's, you know, hundreds of bears around or wherever you, wherever <laughs> you're living, you know, somewhere that you feel secure and just wait as, I mean, the, I think the key thing is to walk somewhere, not, not somewhere that's really going to be full of, you know, um, holes in the ground and, and rocks to fall over, but something you feel relatively safe to walk on. Because you're walking and because you're engaging, your intention to see starts to lift and starts to think I'm going to be, you know, connected to what I'm experiencing. And 20, 30 minutes in, more and more actual darkness vision starts to work. You'll, there will be some light, you know, you can't do it in a literally a pitch black place because you won't see anything. Right. There will be some light to bring some very subtle contrast and our periphery is actually really good at it. That's a really great experience. You've got to be patient and, you know, go with a friend and chat about it as you're going and you'll ex share experiences. Yeah, I, you thank, know, you sharing, yeah. thank you for sharing that. I did a, an episode on peripheral vision and we talked about that, that it takes, like you said, it, the, when the light turns on, if you're in a pitch black dark room, you turn the light on, the pupils immediately close, like we quickly. But when it comes to letting that, I always think of the film, like I used to sit with my dad in the dark room, we would do these black and white, like, you know, um, dark room. And the picture is kind of the developer, right? The, the picture slowly appears. And it's kind of like that with night vision. You have to be patient. And like Kevin said, the periphery is actually really, our rod sets are great at peripheral vision. And um, and I think I love what you said about being present and being curious. And we tend to just walk around and chit chat and our thoughts are what I'm going to make for dinner, what am I going to do tomorrow, when do I have to wake up? Um, you know, we're always so busy and never in the in, in this present. And that's where vision happens. And then when you're present and you're really connecting you see so much more than you think. And so automatically thinking, I can't see anything, and which I hear all the time. It's like, give yourself you know, space and time. And like Kevin said, be in a place where it's safe. Because if you're not feeling safe, you can't relax, and then your peripheral vision will not be working anyway. So you have to definitely feel relaxed and do baby steps. Um, yeah, that's a great. And I also, I love what you said about light pollution, that we're really not getting that darkness anymore like we used to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah great great so we have a question and i mean i'd kind of answered that already delia was asking why did movements with the letter o we did the movement with the letter o horizontally is there also movement vertically with the ocular swing and obviously yes it doesn't matter you can do diagonal um in most cases and let you know my example was the stairs where i was walking up the flight of stairs that is vertical uh, but a lot of the stuff that we do in daily life is, uh, you know, we are more horizontal movement, you know, as humans, we, we don't really have a lot of predators coming from above. And so we don't really usually do that much vertical stuff unless we climb ladders or we climb rocks or we go upstairs. Um, or maybe if you're in a parachute, I'm assuming I've never done that. I've never jumped out of a plane, but I can imagine that that's, you know, there's a lot of oppositional visual illusion of movement. Um Okay, well, um, I don't see any more questions. So um, I'm excited to have you on, Kevin, in two weeks um, to talk about the Alexander technique and the Bates method and what are the similarities. Lovely. Uh, yeah, and, and your own story of how you discovered the it's it, it's going to be fun. Yep. So ha excited to have you on. And we in the Clear Vision Club, we have a little bit extra time here on Zoom. So Kevin will stay and we can have a little bit more of a conversation. And for YouTube, everybody... Um, yes, Lorna, I agree. Awareness is so important and being present. 
So YouTube, we see you next week. Um, also a super interesting conversation about osteoporosis and vision and bone health. So we have that next week. So Kevin, thank you so much for being here today. And again, we will stay on Zoom, 